eight, of course, the description there of love that we hear read at almost every single uh, wedding uh, that, that takes place in churches. Uh, so Paul was certainly capable of writing uh, poetic lines uh, like this uh, instead of just quoting from some other hymn that had already been written. But these verses are really regarded as some of the most important verses in the entire New Testament in terms of establishing the deity of Jesus Christ. And, and so let me go ahead and read them. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And so as we, we heard last week when Walt was introducing kind of the, the big picture summary of the book of Colossians, uh, false teachers were having influence uh, and, and uh, inroads into uh, the church of Colossae. And, and uh, they were very confused about creation. Uh, they taught that matter was evil, including the human body. And they also taught that Jesus Christ did not really have a human body, uh, since that would have put him in contact with evil matter. And so the results of the false teaching were really tragic, which, like any false teaching, goes to one extreme or the other, uh, including the extreme of asceticism on one hand and really unbridled sin on the other. And at, when you think about it, after all, if your body is sinful, you'll either enslave it or uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it in a sinful way at one extreme or the other. So in this section, there's just those few verses there that I read uh, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Paul really explains a fourfold relationship of Jesus Christ to creation. And so let me just kind of unpack that now uh, in these verses. Uh, the first is that he existed before creation. Jesus existed before creation. That's verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. Uh, the term that's used there, I read it in the NIV, is firstborn. Uh, it doesn't refer to chronology, uh, but it refers to a place or status. Jesus Christ was not uh, being created since he himself is the creator of all things. Firstborn there simply implies of first importance uh, or first rank. Uh, you see a similar idea of this in the Old Testament where it says uh, Solomon was certainly not the first of all of David's son, yet in Psalm 89, 27, he's named the firstborn. So, so he was the most important. And that's the idea here talking about Christ when it says firstborn, he's the firstborn of all creation, means not the first in creation, but prior to creation. And so Jesus Christ is not a created being, he's an eternal God. And, and Paul used the word image uh, to make this fact really clear. And, and this word in Greek, or image here, actually means an exact representation and revelation. Uh, similar to the idea of uh, what the writer of Hebrews affirmed, that Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. That's Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 3. And, and this is why Jesus also was able to say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14, 9, uh, because he is the exact image of the Father. In essence, God is invisible, the Father, but Jesus Christ has revealed the Father to us. Uh, that's what John 1, 18 says, no one has ever seen God, but, but the one and only Son who, he, who is himself God is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known, revealed him, his image to us. So nature reveals the existence, the power, the wisdom of God, but uh, nature cannot reveal the essence of who God is to us. It's only through Jesus Christ that the invisible God is revealed perfectly. And since no mere creature can perfectly reveal God, 
then Jesus Christ has to be God uh, because he's perfect and he's a perfect representation uh, of the image of God. So the first thing in verse 15 is he existed before creation. The second point in terms of Jesus's relationship to creation is found in verse 16, the first part, and that is that he created all things. Since Christ uh, created all things, he himself is uncreated. The word for there uh, that introduced this verse could really be translated because. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all because he created all things. And, and it's no wonder that uh, when you see Jesus's life, that the winds and the waves obeyed him, uh, diseases and death fled from him. Uh, because he's the master over all. Uh, this is what uh, John 1, 3 says, all things were made for him. Uh, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made and has been made. This includes all things in heaven, all things in earth, all things that are visible, all things that are invisible. Uh, all things are under his command. And, and then the third a way in which Christ relates to creation that we find here in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, is all things exist for him. The latter part of verse 16. Everything exists in him, for him, and through him. And so Jesus Christ is the sphere, if you will, in which everything exists. He's the agent through which they come into being, and he's the one for whom everything was actually made. And it's kind of interesting to drill down into this. Uh, Paul actually uses three different prepositions in a way of ref refuting the philosophy of false teachers. Uh, for centuries, the Greek philosophers had taught that everything uh, needed a primary cause, an instrumental cause, and then a final cause. And the primary cause is the plan, the instrumental cause is the power, and the final cause is the purpose. And when it comes to creation, Jesus Christ is the primary cause. He planned it. He's the instrumental cause. He produced it. And he's the final cause. He did it for his own pleasure, for himself. And so Paul really just uh, unravels uh, this whole idea that Jesus wasn't God by even his approach here of dismantling this Greek philosophy and saying, no, that actually is who Jesus Christ is exactly. He planned it, he produced it, and he did it for his own pleasure. And if everything in creation exists for him, then nothing can be evil of itself, of course, except Satan and his, his fallen angels. Uh, but even in those, God accomplishes his will. And, and so Gnostic regulations about using God's creation are all really foolish and uh, we'll get to that uh, when we get to Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. It also means that God's creation, even though it's under bondage to sin, uh, can be used for God's glory and enjoyed by God's people. Romans 8, 22 says, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And, and so even there, we see that, that creation was for him, but also for our enjoyment as well. And then the fourth uh, aspect of the relationship that Jesus Christ has preeminent over creation in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 through 17 is and I love this he holds all things together verse 17 uh, NIV says in him all things hold together all matter we know from science is composed of rapidly moving uh, electric particles and uh, matter is made up primarily of space. There are these particles that are moving, but there's a huge amount of space in between them. And, and you may ask, uh, you know, science, well, what holds the particles together? Uh, for science, 
there's real, real difficulty in answering that question. What holds these particles, electric particles of matter together? But for Christians, we have an answer, Jesus. Jesus Christ holds all things together because he is before all things and he can hold all things together. And again, this is another affirmation that Jesus Christ is God. Only God existed before creation. Only God can hold creation all together. And to make Jesus Christ less than God it is really to dethrone him. And so all things were created by him. He made all things. He also controls all things. And in him, all things are held together. And, and that's really, I think, the, the message of this passage, Colossians 1, 15 through 17, that he is preeminent. Christ is over all creation. Masterful job. Can you put on the chat the three, uh, the primary instrumental and the other cause, the three? I'd love to make sure I have that in my notes somewhere. Sure. That was amazing. I loved it. I could listen to this all day. Um, and gentlemen, this is why the early church fathers wrestled with this issue for many centuries. And, you know, the Council of Nicaea, of course, had to do with debating the Arians over the divinity of Christ. Bishop Arius said that the Son uh, was not at one time, and he actually sang a song about it. They went all over the empire, so we almost lost the divinity of Christ in the early church. Then uh, the Arians lost at the council, but then it was revived again 10 years later. It's like modern-day uh, Jehovah Witnesses. Then the Council of Constantinople, which is 381 AD, reaffirmed the Council of Nicaea, which is 325 AD, and not only that, they also put the Holy Spirit as equal to the Father and Son. Uh, and uh, they called it uh, homo usius, where they were all equal with each other of the same essence. And then you have the Council of Chalcedon in 451, where they were debating on the nature of Christ. You had the Eutychians who thought Christ only had one nature. You had the Apollinarians who believed that uh, Jesus only had a physical body, that the Logos filled, and basically Jesus was a puppet um, of the divine and didn't have real humanity. Then you had the Nestorians who believed that Jesus uh, not only had two natures, but he had he was two persons in one nature. And uh, so the Council of Chalcedon was... Uh, put together to say that Jesus was one person with two natures. It's called a hypostatic union. So according to Orthodox Christianity, Jesus has two natures, a human will and a divine will, which you see in the Garden of Gethsemane. And both of them together make one person, not two persons, so that contradicts the era of Apollinarius, the era of the Nestorians, and uh, gives us a historic faith uh, related to the fact that Jesus is one person with two natures, and it's still a, a mystery. So this cannot be overstated. What Greg just taught, people fought over it. And uh, it, if we lose the divinity of Christ, we lose everything. So I have a question for you, Greg. Sure. Understanding and having a high Christology impacts everything. He is before all things. Everything consists through him and everything exists for him. So how does that impact your life personally in a practical way? I, I think real practically, well, uh, you know, just even in the middle of, uh, in the middle of uh, this, this pandemic rather that we've been having, you know, the, with the coronavirus, uh, it, it causes me when it seems like things are uncertain or troubled, uh, major changes going on, that uh, it allows me to deepen my trust in him, that he really is in control, uh, regardless of uh, what might seem to be happening in circumstances and situations around me. Uh, one of the things that also kept um, 
just jumping into my mind as I was preparing for it is uh, that I think there's a lot that can be said about our even environmental responsibility as a result of, of what Colossians says here. Uh, that that uh, he created it all for himself. We get to enjoy it, but we're also supposed to be stewards of it. Uh, and, you, you know, I, I think that sometimes Christianity, we can be, uh, that there tends to, we go to extremes and everything, like it's not important at all, the environment, or uh, it's, it's actually to the point of uh, worship. Uh, the, it's creation that, that's, that's really worship. Um, but, but that kept rumbling through my mind as well as just uh, that it has real environmental issues uh, about how we need to see creation itself and tend and steward the creation uh, that God has placed us in. It's for him, by him, um, and we get to enjoy it. So even as we were out uh, refreshing the mulch beds and planting flowers Memorial Day weekend, I was just thinking, this is for him. This is really not for me. Uh, and even beautifying the you know postage stamp yard that I have here to the best of my ability, I enjoy it, but it really, it's for him. And uh, he's entrusted that into my care. And he's saying, Greg, you know, it, I've given this to you. Uh, what are you going to do with it as a result of it in your stewardship? So those are some thoughts that come to mind. Open floor for, for about uh, six minutes before we start the next session. Anybody? Questions? I, comments? I have a question. Okay. I'll go ahead. Oh, um, I think that theologically, this brings up a very current event um, for us. And I don't say any names to dishonor anybody, but just for a matter of theological discussion. Um, there's a, a documentary, two documentaries that came out called The American Gospel, which I've not watched the complete versions of either one, but I watched part of one of them. And I'm well aware of their theology. But they're, they're roasting people like Bill Johnson and Todd White for saying things like, Christ did not do his miracles as God, but as a man to demonstrate what was possible, like through the power, you know, th by yielding to the power of the father. So when it comes to Colossians one, and we even reference that Jesus stopped the wind and the waves or miracles because he's, he's God. So some people are accusing people like Bill Johnson and, and Todd White of preaching a heresy saying that, you know, denying the divinity of Christ, which I, I'm not going to get into what I personally think about it, but I just think, how does this relate to that? discussion bishop joe and greg you did an awesome job sharing uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts on on miracles and the divinity of christ and our theological framework how it relates here go ahead greg um you know i think obviously as in philippians 2 the kenosis the emptying uh that jesus emptied himself you know probably plays into this i, I think it just get in a real uh fragile place uh uh, again, based on Colossians, when we start to kind of minimize uh, his divinity, did he do miracles out of his divinity? Uh, that, that's a pretty intricate uh, theological uh, position, uh, big question there. Um, I just think it's really, really important that we hold fast to he was fully God. Uh, and fully man, but fully God. We don't want to minimize that at all in, in the place of trying to kind of, uh, what, what's the word that I want? Uh, you, you know, uh, just kind of thread the needle of, of uh, answering that question. And so I think it does, we do get really on uh, thin ice sometimes with some of those. I think they're important questions. Um, but certainly we don't want to arrive at any conclusion that would uh, minimize his role as being the creator, the sustainer uh, of all creation, even while he was uh, in his humanity here on earth for those 33 or so years. Um, yeah, I'm going to so, really defer to Bishop Joe on that. <laughs> well, the, what Bill Johnson means and uh, Todd White, and uh, Kenneth Hagin used to say the same thing. We have to understand, guys like Kenneth Hagin are Bible teachers, but they're not theologians. You could be a great Bible teacher, but just have a specific lane like faith or healing. But it doesn't mean you're a theologian. 
um, and not too many are theologians, unfortunately. There should be more. I think every pastor should strive to be a theologian and not just a good Bible teacher. And uh, basically, these guys don't know how to qualify the statement. So Greg answered it there is the kenosis, the emptying. Um, and you could see that played out that Jesus did not do anything until he was anointed of the Holy Ghost. So that's all they're trying to say is that mm -hmm. they're not saying he wasn't God. They're saying that the way Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit, even Acts chapter one, it says through the spirit, he gave the disciples commandments. Everything he did was through the spirit. Acts chapter 10, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So all the scripture verifies that, the, that Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit and it was anointed, but it doesn't mean he was less than God. It just means that he emptied himself in the same way he said, no one knows the day or the hour, uh, not even the sun when it comes to the second coming. Uh, so he emptied himself of his power. It's a mystery without diminishing his divinity. Uh, and you could argue he emptied himself of some of his omniscience because he said not even the son knows the day or the hour so that he could be fully man, fully dependent upon God and totally enter into our experience of humans. He had to empty himself of certain divine attributes without, and that was by his own choice, which means that, you know, uh, if I choose not to get in my Lamborghini, it doesn't mean it's not my Lamborghini. That's mm -hmm. the difference. By his own choice, he uh, depended on the Holy Spirit so that he could be a model for us. But it didn't mean that he couldn't do it without the Holy Spirit. So that's where the kenosis comes. He yeah. willfully, he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself. That's what this whole thing means. It's his choice. He became obedient even unto the death of, of the cross. So that's all it means. So Bill Johnson, he's not a theologian. Todd White's only saved, what, seven years? And uh, a little more, but yeah. So they, they don't, um, you know, sometimes maybe they do qualify the statements in other sermons. Maybe American Gospel just picks and chooses parts of this yeah. sermon. If people did that to me, they'd call me a heretic too. I think our I just said, I just said something last Sunday and uh, I didn't realize I said it until I watched the message and someone could take that little thing and say that I'm off mm -hmm. and I can't remember what it was, but you know, so. I think you we, might consider uh, writing an article on that Bishop Joe, because there's a lot of division. I think as pastors, our people get in the crosshairs where they start thinking some of these people are heretics or they start, you know, bashing the American gospel people. And I think we need a, a theologian like you to, speak to it in a current event in a blog or something i had a couple just leave my church because they watched the american gospel mm -hmm. and they said that we are associated with the apostolic movement so i said well the apostolic movement is like saying evangelicals you could have fall fall left far they, 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 and the american gospel is playing on the fears of people so if you already are walking in fear and you don't trust as in the beginning before you watch that. It just isolates you and makes you not trust any pastor, basically. Mm -hmm. So some of these documentaries are, you know, maybe they're helpful. I haven't seen them, but, you know, look, I just think that uh, we need some pastoral wisdom. Maybe mm -hmm. one more comment before we start hey, the next hey, routine. Hey, Bishop, I'll, I'll just weigh in real quickly with that. But um, I, I definitely wouldn't consider myself a theologian. Uh, but I'm an aspiring one, <laughs> and and I believe it's so vital. And I thought your explanation of that was masterful, really great. The uh, the contribution I'd like to make with it is that I'm I'm learning that the idea of false dichotomies, of doing violence to separating and fragmenting scriptures and truths, that they take truths and they pit them against one another. And they create a framework that's impossible to explain any viable, verified truth in. 
So it's almost like you've got to deconstruct the entire framework from which they're coming because he was fully God, but he was fully walking as a man, sinless though. So the, the framework is so satanic that it's, it's pitting two wonderful foundational truths against one another. And I'm seeing this as a trend in false teachings that it's stemming from false dichotomies. Just wanted to share that. Yep. No, that's a great. Yeah. yeah. There, Joe, if I could say something real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. There's a guy on YouTube named Justin Peters. He's just one among several who, who um, you know, points out the errors of, of some of the doctrines. And I have to say that I mostly agree with a lot of things that he shares, but I also see how he has, um, you know, taken some things to extremes himself. I think all of us, when we decide to be the, the doctrinal police ourselves, need to be careful what ground we stand on. But he, the things that he's, he's, he's kind of pointing out, there are some gross fallacies that has already infected the faith camp, which I myself for years have drank from that that stream, but there are some gross fallacies as it pertains to Christology. And I think that um, the concerns are real, but I think I've seen him also take people like a Todd White and others who may be not so deeply immersed in, in that pool that maybe have said things that could be construed and, and just that clip. And it can certainly make it look as if that everybody pretty much is in, is in error. You know, I'm, and I think most of us don't have the discernment to know the difference because like you say, Joe, more of us need to be theologians. More, more of us need to be more thoughtful expositors of the word of God. But it's, 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 we never saw the need to equip ourselves to do it, you know. And as a result, we have error multiplying and multiplying. So I think a lot of that comes from the concerns that these guys are raising. Some of them are legitimate. Some of them are just overblown things, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we have to, you know, we have to be careful and uh, a lot of these, we don't give each other grace, you know, but I will say the word of faith, um, definitely after Hagen went off a rail in some ways, um, in some people, not all of them, and the expression of it now seems to be the hyper grace, Joseph Prince, or... Uh, some other things, but, well, the motivational, you know, messages, but I did hear two video clips from Creflo Dollar that were greatly disturbing, mm -hmm. where he said the biggest hoax in Christianity for the last 2,000 years is that Jesus is God. And you can look it up yourself. I, I saw two different clips. Whoa. Somebody told me about it. Um, and uh, I don't know why people in the Word of Faith camp aren't calling him out for that. So, again, he's not a theologian, so these guys could easily go off a rail because they're trying to focus on the fact that, you know, we could be superhumans. We could use our faith. Look at Jesus. He wasn't God. And look what God did through him. That's their point. So if you're focused just on one aspect of the counsel of God, you could get into heresy because you don't see the fullness of scripture. We're going to go into the next part. Let's welcome John Hammer. John, you got 12 minutes and then we're going to have some dialogue. Go ahead. All right. Thanks, Bishop Joe, for giving me a short passage, just one verse, because you know I'm long winded. Um, and excellent job, Greg. I really appreciate it. Walt's talk last week was making my heart explode. So if I pass out during this talk, it's because I'm just so in love with Jesus. And I think, how can you read Colossians 1 and not feel that way? Well, in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, we have a phrase that if you control the head, you control the body. Meaning that, you know, if you lose the head, then you lose control of being able to defend yourself against your opponent. Like wherever the head goes, the body's going to follow. And so I thought that was an interesting uh, illustration and thought as we jump into first, or Colossians 1 verse 18 and he Jesus is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence and Walt did a masterful job of explaining how the preeminence of Christ is really the whole key to understanding the book of Colossians and this is right where we find 
that whole key is in verse 18. And uh, Walt did a better job than I could have ever imagined doing on explaining preeminence. And eminence means to come first, come before or is first. And preeminence means that is to become before the first. So when we're saying that Christ is preeminent, we're saying that Christ is before my number one, that Christ is even before first things, puts him in a category uh, all by himself. Uh, so we look at this statement from the Apostle Paul, and he says that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And the head, of course, refers to, is kind of a double meaning referring to both um, the literal like head of a body, the head of an of an organism, the face, the personality, the intelligence, uh, where all the life and, and instruction and guidance flows from. And then also is the head is also used as like the head of an organization or the leader or, you know, the, uh, the, the one in charge. Um, and so uh, reading through this, we see, first of all, that um, I think we, we look at this whole concept of dualism, like, in the Western mindset, we think of, well, I can be a Christian and not go to church, uh, you know, or I, I can go to heaven when I, I can be a follower of Jesus, but not be a part of the church. Or is it more important to have faith in Christ or to be a part of the church? And Paul here is, in a, in a sense, confronting a dualist, a dualistic mindset all really throughout as he's confronting Gnosticism. So I think that's one of the ways that Gnosticism creeps in is that we like to separate Christ and his church. Um, but here we see that Paul is keeping them tied together, that they are, that they are inextricably connected together, that Jesus is the head of the body. Um, we see that F.F. Uh, F. Bruce said that as far as the organic relationship is concerned, Christ and his people are viewed together as a living entity. Christ is the head supplying life and exercising control and direction. His people are his body individually, his limbs and organs under his control obeying his direction, performing his work, and the life which animates the whole is his risen life, which he shares with his people. So we see that he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Uh, the beginning, as Greg did a great job explaining, doesn't mean that Christ was the first one resurrected, because we know that, in a sense, Old Testament saints were resurrected to a place of paradise. We know that other people Jesus raised physically from the dead through his life and ministry before he was crucified and raised three days later. So he's not the first in the sense that he was ever first, the first one resurrected, but he's the one that's the most important. If he's not resurrected, ultimately there would be no other resurrections. So he is both the, the, the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. He's not only the beginning of creation, he's the beginning of the church. The church gets its life through him and the authority that he has to, to create the church is because of his resurrection life and conquering death being the first one to be born from the dead uh we see also that it is the risen christ who is the head of the body which is the church according to bruce in resurrection as well as in creation he receives the title the beginning and the firstborn so his resurrection marked his triumph over all the forces that held men and women in bondage and then Paul does something interesting with this phrase, the firstborn from the dead, because he links birth and death. So he basically is saying that from the tomb, God created a womb. And it was in that place of death that Jesus supplanted the powers of death. And he caused a whole new group of people, his church, his body to be resurrected and to experience and share in his life. And Paul, of course, says that this is so, so that in all things, Christ may have the preeminence. And Warren Wearsby said it very well that Paul's word um, born in connection with his death, uh, these two concepts seem opposed to each other, right? But it was the, the tomb was a womb for which Christ came forth in victory. And the false teachers of uh, Paul's day, the, the Gnostics, they would not have necessarily denied the importance of Jesus Christ, according to Wearsby that they would simply dethrone him, giving him prominence, but not preeminence. In their philosophy, Jesus was one of the many emanations that proceed from God and through which men could reach God. So it was this claim that Paul refutes in this section. Probably no paragraph in the New Testament contains more concentrated doctrine about Jesus Christ than this one. 
we can keep ourselves from going on a detour if we remember that Paul wrote to prove the preeminence of Christ. And he did so by using these uh, unanswerable arguments uh, that he's presenting here. And so I think that as pastors, as aspiring theologians, as preachers of the word of God, we need to get our mind and our heart so wrapped up in the wonder, the ecstasy, the reality, the truth, the foundation that Christ Christ is to is preeminent in all things, and He wants to be made preeminent through all things, through His church, and through His people. And I think that where we look at observing this, interpreting it, and applying it to our lives, we have to say that there is uh, that there is a high privilege of being the church, and we need to honor and we need to res- theologically restore the honor of being one with Christ. And a lot of emphasis. Uh, in our in our culture that I've heard is more on kind of the humanistic side, if you will, of I don't know if I'm using that word properly or not, but I think I think maybe I am in the sense that, you know, there was a popular Christian song a while ago. If we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? And it's kind of the emphasis on, you know, what are we going to do? But I think before we do, we have to actually ask as the body, are we connected with our head? Are we making much of the head? When you think of a person, the body is completely you know, supports the head. When you think of a person, you don't think of, you know, their arms or their legs or their organs or how, even how big their muscles are, how overweight or how thin they might be. You think of their face, you think of their head. That's where the whole, their whole body uh, derives its life from. And when, so when you embrace, a, think of even embracing a person, you're still thinking of their face, their head that makes them unique. And the church always gets off course when we don't make Christ preeminent in our preaching, in our theology, in our, in our, our view of scripture. One of my um, professors in Bible college, uh, he used to always say this and it stuck with me, brother Cornish. He said, wherever you cut the book, it bleeds the atoning blood. So I think if Christ is meet, is preeminent in all things, he better be preeminent in our understanding of scripture. And we should be looking at for the story of Christ from Genesis to revelation. So it has to start with our biblical worldview. If, if he's supposed to be preeminent in all things, then it has to start with our understanding of the scripture and definitely our preaching of the gospel. R.T. Kendall told a group of preachers, he said, if you don't preach the blood, turn your badge in. And Charlie Spurgeon said, introduce the passage and make a beeline for the cross. I think that it is so important that we start making Christ preeminent in our in our own personal devotion as we're reading the scriptures, in our prayer life, and then definitely in our preaching and the leadership of our church, that people need to see, uh, you know, uh, an, inc- an inseparable bond between Jesus and between the church. So when they see the church, they think of Jesus. How would Jesus handle this? How would Jesus lead? What is Jesus doing? What does Jesus think? That this has to get down to the practical areas of our life and our communication. It's not just a spiritual answer to say, well, Jesus is the senior pastor of my church. No, he is the senior pastor. He is the upper shepherd. I'm the lower shepherd that's serving him to serve his flock. And people need to see him represented in how we, and how we live and move. And I think that if Christ is to be, if we are the body, then the way Christ reaches into the earth is primarily through the church. So even there is a balance, even as Bishop Joe's taught us before, as many of you, of course, have friendship with him and have followed his teaching, this whole seven mountains mandate, it, we see a little bit of that implication that Christ wants to be preeminent in all things. So I think in science, in creation, in arts, in entertainment, in every created order, uh, Christ wants to be preeminent and expressed in all those things. But there is a false dualism that says that if you're out expressing Christ in these areas and you're separate from the church, that somehow you're more cutting edge or you are more kingdom minded. No, it's through the church that Christ wants to influence all these other areas. Now we know there is a common grace where Christ also works through government. He works through scientists and inventors that are not Christians to benefit the whole of mankind. But his primary vehicle that he wants to influence the earth is not the white house, but his house. So God is more concerned with the leadership of the church than the leadership of nations. God is more concerned with how the church expresses the preeminence of Christ. And, and so we want to not have a dualism in, in a sense, escaping from the world, but we want Christ to be manifest in all things. But we also want to escape the dualism of thinking that we represent Christ to the world apart from the church, because it's we, we, the church are his body, then that he is reaching into the earth to express his glory, his rule, his dominion, his beauty, and his majesty. So we need to get back 
plugged into the head, making him preeminent in all things. Wow. That's amazing. Very practical. Um, well, because we're going to end this in 10 minutes, I'm going to let you guys, the floor is open. So go ahead. I love this. This is incredible. I love this. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, that was great. And, and uh, really, really got my, I don't know, got me going. And I, I would say kind of tying back to what we were talking about earlier, the question that you asked and then what you were also mentioning. I think a lot of times people elevate their doctrine over the Lordship of Christ. Um, and that's, that's another one of those reasons why you have the Arminian camp and the Calvinist camp and the faith camp and all that stuff is we elevate uh, whatever hill we want to die on over the Lordship and the supremacy of Christ as well. So I would just, yeah. But yeah, John, that was phenomenal. Thank you. Um, you know, I came out of a Pentecostal church, church background, and um, my pastor was not a theologian. He was clever, but he was, he was not a, a theologian. And I watched him make many, many errors. And a lot of the, him, both himself and the preachers that he would bring in, they seemed to be uh, people who thought Jesus was just the basics. He was just the entry point into Christianity. <laughs> but but if, you, if you were going to really be deep, Christ was the least. To mention his name was, was the very, very least you could do. Um, you know, but that real deep depth of knowledge and... and you know, was, was, was other stuff. And this is why I think uh, I, I see that same thing happening right now with a lot of the, the Christological errors and fallacies that are being preached by people who are, and they're not being corrected because again, so many of us were trained or raised up under people who didn't respect scholarship and who didn't take the time themselves to do their due diligence to showing up respect for the word of God to present it properly. And I think that's why so much Era exist, um, and I and I'm just I'm just grateful for this exercise because I mean I'm fortunate you know that I've you know God has blessed me and I've been exposed I've been around Joe I've been around Larry Stocksell and other good men who are Jesus lovers and they've mentored me they've had a good hand in my life but I just I I hurt for pastors who sincerely love God but don't have a spot like this to even kind of just have this impartation happen over their lives because. You know, in all sincerity, none of us leave, leave off from our starting point in ministry that we're going to make a lot of errors and lead a lot of people astray. We never do that. But pride gets in the way. And we listen to these guys who are so clever, so prominent, so crafty, and we end up following what they do. I just said all that to say, I thank you, Joe, again, for this exercise and for this, this time together going through the book of Colossians. Yeah, Bishop. Um... Uh, I want to ask you a question, Bishop, and maybe you could even weigh on this, John. Um, we're going through Colossians and we're uh, trying we're to protect the theology that we have replaced the Jewish part of the church. Uh, okay. We... That was strange. I don't know what that was. Okay. Is that the lower? Hold on. <laughs> All we right, go ahead. I'm to record sorry. it. No, okay. <laughs> so in the, culture, in the cultural context of our day, you know, looking at it when you see in verse 18, where it says, in every respect that he might occupy the chief place. And I love how you said that, John, about uh, giving Christ prominence, but not giving him preeminence. So we're dealing with a resurgence of, um, you know, just, just racial enmity and animosity among the unregenerate, the lost, right, the, the, the unsaved. And so I think so many times, even uh, culturally and contextually saying, are we giving Christ the preeminence even over our cultures, our colors, our, our pigmentation versus our principles, our complexion versus our Christianity? Uh, are we placing um, our own particular uh, vantage points and, and, and issues racially um, that cause us to have a consistent clash and collide culturally? Because many Christians, we can't speak for the world, but we speak for the church. Many Christians don't realize that we have to submit our cultures to a kingdom culture. And sometimes that means amputating and augmenting things, even in our ethnic origins and our understandings and subjecti uh, subjectifying that to Christ and giving him preeminence in every principle and every uh, politic and every position and every platform. And so many times we see a compartmentalization with Christians in the American context and in the church where they like to separate that. And I think we're seeing um, just those different clashes 
even at least among Christians, because I don't think people really even understand what verse 18 is really saying and how he is given the preeminence above anything um, that we were raised in, we saw no matter what side of the tracks we live on and how are we really filtering that through Christology and his preeminence saying, I have to subject my emotions, my ideals, my ideologies um, to this. And that means I may have to take up a cross culturally and die for a greater unity and an integration. And that, and, and that's something I wanted you to weigh on because I think that's the first thing I started seeing here, that he has to be given preeminence. No matter what I feel and what I see among the lost and the unregenerate, I have to filter that through the pre preeminence of Jesus Christ. And say, God, what do you think about this? How should I respond to this? What should I say based on who you are? So, you know, um, John or Bishop, you can weigh on that just on the present circumstance of what we're seeing. Well, the, the unregenerate thing is, culture. If you, if you study church history, the unfortunate reality is that most of the uh, church is looking at the scripture through the lens of their culture and their context rather than extracting themselves out of the context and looking at it through the lens of, of, of scripture. And that is a hermeneutical di dilemma. It takes skill. It takes self-awareness. It's not just learning Bible. It's a lot of people learn Bible, but don't understand how to extract themselves out of culture and it's impossible to fully extract yourself so that's where you know you have to continually read scripture let the holy spirit challenge you have these kind of dialogical communities um this kind of dialogical community is the rarest i've ever seen i've never seen an apostolic group do scripture together never seen it um so what we have here is quite amazing um, Can I weigh in and, on something? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the global table is starting, and we're going to have Larry Stock still sharing with us in a few minutes. I also want to remind you that for those of you interested in doing the certified executive cohort with me, we're having another conversation, Zoom meeting, this same Zoom uh, at four o'clock today, Eastern Time. So uh, we're probably going to launch this thing mid-July, but you have to sign up by June 15th. Okay, so Mike, go ahead. Maybe you and maybe one other comment. Go ahead. Maybe you would be the last. Frankie, I really appreciate your question and what you were alluding to. Um, you know, last fall, we I took our church verse by verse through the book of Colossians. Because down here in Georgia, you know, the town is still split by the tracks, the African-American side, the white side, and and uh, we did a church plant in a town that still told African Americans they weren't in the allowed in a Baptist church. I mean, we're we're still a hundred years behind culture down here. And um, and so one of the things I did is I had an African American pastor do a service with me in the Book of Colossians about chapter three, where it says our life is hidden in Christ, and therefore you know we don't exist anymore. It's hidden in Him. And the only way that we can be a bridge to reconcile people is if we take the view you talked about is I've chapter one, I've been conveyed into a kingdom, which means I'm hidden in Christ. I don't exist anymore. Chapter three, I'm hidden in Christ. I don't exist anymore. And so my ethnicity and my rights to that have to come second to the kingdom. And so I had a woman come up and say, I want to do a black history service in our church. And I just said, well, are you, you know, I said, are, are you a kingdom member or, you know, of this earth? And she was like, what are you talking about? And I said, we could spend all of our days doing a white history, a Latino history, a black history. We could do all these things and that'd be good. But we're looking at it from the wrong vantage. And truly, even with this Ahmad situation with the young man that got shot in Georgia and murdered, um, you know, it has really flared things back up in our city and we're dealing with a lot of things. And the only way I can approach it is if I see everybody through a kingdom. And so I just want to commend you for that because that is the only way we can bring re reconciliation in a godly manner is if we all die to our physical identity and leave a kingdom identity. And I just, I appreciate it, Frankie. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a very, very complex thing. The church needs to speak into culture. Pentecost mm -hmm. Sunday was all about speaking the language of Babylon, basically, being able to communicate the wonders of God to all nations, which Acts 1.8 also commands us to go to all nations. So the power of the Holy Spirit is not just given so that we can speak in tongues or pray for the sick. The power of the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we could have strategy to reach all cultures, to reach all contexts, and to be able to uh, uh, challenge these racial divides. And, um, you know, and, and when people are looking at life and through scripture, they're trying to get comfort out of their suffering. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what arises is a, uh, a narrow view that they're preaching based on their own experience. Now, now, if their heart is right with God, they'll still lead people to the right place. You know, I, I look at St. Augustine said this, basically, if someone's interpretation of scripture is wrong, but their motivation is right and they lead you to God, it's more important than uh, having the right interpretation, but it's not leading you to God in some ways. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing, and we could actually... If you want yeah. to read a good book on this, the greatest missiologist of the 20th century is Leslie Newbegin. He's an Anglican bishop. I've read his book many times. He's greatly impacted me. I can't agree with everything he said, but he has the book called The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society. That is an amazing book, The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society. And also reading his life story was an impact for me. Uh, he was the one who really, you could argue, started the whole discipline of being a missiologist. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't known in the 19th century. So I believe it started mid 20th. And the missiologists are basically, you know, even Peter Wagner was one where they're not theologians necessarily. Some of them could be, but they are focused totally on how to contextualize the gospel and strategize with with church denomination and others and how to reach people for christ so we're gonna segue now to the global table thank you for joining us and uh we're just going to give a few minutes here to allow people to join we already have a, uh, a meeting prior to this with our private table and we're going through the book of colossians and it's it's an amazing experience. I could stay in Colossians for the rest of my life. Colossians and Hebrews. If I had to pick one book of the Bible that I would teach the rest of my life, probably be the book of Hebrews. Um, to me, I could listen to it. I must listen to it a hundred times in the last year. It's a worshipful experience because it's all about comparing Jesus to every aspect of uh, the Bible. You know every major character and every major system and covenant um one of these days if god permits me probably i'll have to wait 10 years i want to write a book on having a christological ecclesiology that's really what it's all about so much can be said about that okay well we're going to have